So good evening, everybody. Yes, uh, we are live now. Yes, now we are live. Okay, fine. Yeah. Thank you, Shubham. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome back again uh, to the ongoing lecture series that's conducted by Gokhale Memorial Girls College, Kolkata. And uh, the topic for today's talk is a very interesting topic indeed. The talking practice of Adda, a post-partition remembrance. We do have, uh, have among us um, Dr. Aisha Sheel, who's a postdoctorate researcher at the Department of Culture, Fa uh, Faculty of Arts, University of Helsinki. And she's also a visiting research fellow at the Department of English, King's College, London. She has received the Bonami Dobre Scholarship for both MA and her doctoral dissertation from the University of Leeds, uh, where she has conducted her doctoral research program. Um, her doctoral research is on representing Adda, radical capitalism, Bengaliness, and post-partition melancholia. Uh, she has also re received a fully funded postdoctoral fellowship by the research program Zukun's Philologie, revisiting the canons of textual scholarship. Uh, over to you, Dr. Sheel. Uh, thank you so much, Durva, for that introduction. Well, in fact, I uh, sort of completed my postdoctoral research at Helsinki a few months ago, although I'm continuing my association with uh, the Calliope project there as a research affiliate. Um, well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, very many thanks to Shubham and his colleagues at uh, Gokhale College for the lovely invitation and my greetings to all the students and faculty members who've joined us today. Uh, now, my lecture will revolve around the popular Bengali talking pursuit under uh, a subject which initially served as the basis of my doctoral thesis and with which I've recently engaged again following my latest research on Bengali vocal articulations and speaking practices in the 19th and 20th centuries as part of my ongoing work for the ERC-funded Calliope project at the University of Helsinki. Uh, I'm sure most of you are more than familiar with this Bengali pastime. Uh, yet to recap very quickly, um, Adda, as observes Dipesh Chakraborty in his essay, Adda, A History of Sociality, could be best described as a leisurely social practice of friends or family members getting together for long, informal and unrigorous conversations. In this lecture, I will mobilize some of my approaches as a literary and cultural studies scholar to employ this talking practice as a methodological lens for examining the complexities of remembering the political legacy of the 1947 Bengal partition. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Adda, remarks Pratap Kumar Re, is, and I quote, something so quintessentially Bengali that it is difficult to explain to the world. It is not simply conversation or discussion or debate or gossip, and yet it is all these, unquote. Uh, indeed, Adda, affirms Chakraborty, is widely regarded, quote, as an indispensable part of the Bengali character, or as an integral part of such metaphysical notions as life and vitality for the Bengalis, unquote. Next slide. Thank you. Well, such a general perception of Adda's quintessential Bengaliness, I argue, is problematized by the present geopolitical identity of Bengal as a region straddling two different nation states, namely West Bengal in India and Bangladesh, former East Bengal. To that end, my talk will deconstruct Adda's quintessentially Bengali discourse along the memorial axis of the Bengal partition. And for this purpose, we will look at two texts which you might have read and or, or seen already, namely Amitav Kosh's 1988 novel, The Shadow Lines, 
and Rithik Ghatok's 1974 Bengali film, Jukti Tokko Argoppo, which translates as logic, debate, and a story. Thanks, Shubham, for showing up that slide already. We will close read the Adda sessions of the East Bengali grandmother, Tamma, on her upside down house in Dhaka from the Shadow Lines and an Adda between an East Bengali refugee woman, Bongobala, and a West Bengali tribal artist, Ponchanon, from Jukti Tokkwar Gokpo. But before doing so, let me briefly chart the social origins of Adda. Chakraborty traces Adda's leisurely descent from rural Bengal's age-old practice of engaging in everyday conversations at the end of the day. The speech patterns of the Adda, he notes, also grew out of the narrative styles popularized by the Kothakata tradition of telling devotional stories and the formal verbal exchanges at the 19th century Mojlish. Now, the term Mojlish refers to a gathering, meeting or party hosted by a wealthy patron. With the onset of the 20th century, the Mojlish gradually evolved into the modern day democratic realm of the Adda in Bengal's capital city, Calcutta. And the Calcutta Adda in turn came to include a range of urban spaces from one's private home parlor to public parks, buses, trams, tea stalls, coffee houses, bookshops, schools, universities, and elevated verandas called rock. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in fact, here's a picture of an Adda at the rock. Uh, Adda's emergence as a metropolitan pastime went hand in hand with the development of what Chakraborty identifies as the literary cosmopolitanism of educated upper and middle-class Bengali gentlemen. These gentlemen, as you know, were referred to as the Bhadralok. Uh, the West Bengali Hindu ethos of Calcutta's Bhadralok Adda accordingly came to be regarded as a cultural marker of Bengaliness. Next slide, please. Uh, so here's a picture of the Bhadralok Adda at the famous College Street coffee house in Calcutta. Indeed, the quintessentially Bengali modernity of this talking practice, as evident from Chakraborty and Ray's essays and other critical analyses of the Calcutta Adda for that matter, is but overdetermined by the Bhadralok's gentrified moors. To that end, my own work on Abda has emphasized the need to interrogate the discursive predominance of the Bhadralok Adda in order to explore the Adda narratives of other marginalized Bengali communities, both in West Bengal and Bangladesh. And I have demonstrated how these otherized narratives could be voiced via the memory of the Bengal partition as the repressed political subtext of Adda's quintessential Bengaliness. Today's lecture, for its part, will establish how Adda's verbal exchanges covertly articulate the psychosocial complexities of representing a post-partition Bengali subjectivity and its discursive strategies of remembering the uneasy affect worlds produced by the cartographic rifts before and after 47. I will accordingly examine the Addas of the East Bengali grandmother Tamma from the Shadow Lines and the Adda between the East Bengali refugee woman Bongobala and the West Bengali tribal artist Ponchanon from Jukti Tokkur Gappo. But let me first provide a very quick overview of the Bengal partition. Uh, I suppose most of you are well acquainted with the geopolitical ramifications of the partition. Nevertheless, a brief recap will help us understand better the contextual premises of these two Adda sequences from Ghosh's novel and Ghatok's film. Uh, the province of Bengal was partitioned on communal grounds into the Hindu majority areas of West Bengal and the Muslim majority districts of East Bengal, first in 1905, 
by Lord Curzon in British India. And then in 1947, with the partition of the Indian subcontinent into India and Pakistan. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a map of the 1947 Bengal partition, as a result of which West Bengal, with its capital Calcutta, became a state of India, while East Bengal went over to Pakistan and was reincarnated as East Pakistan from 1956. Uh, such cutting-edge scholarly analyses of the Bengal partition as advanced by the works of Joya Chatterjee, Dipesh Chakraborty, Joshua Dharabakchi, and Shubharanjan Dashgupta, to name but a few, have extensively discussed how the history and memory of the partition continues to impact profoundly the political, sociocultural, and psychological contours of the Bengali identity narrative. Bengal's 1947 partition was further complicated, as observes Ananya Jahanara Kabir in her fascinating book, Partitions post Amnesias, by, quote, the uncanny transformation of East Pakistan into Bangladesh in 1971, unquote. Next slide, please. Hence, the regional, uh, uh, hence the regionalization schema of thrice partitioned Bengal, notes Kabir, gave rise to, quote, a most peculiar kind of cartographic irresolution caused by the repeated creation, dissolution, and transformation of the boundary demarcating its eastern and western regions, unquote. Let us now move on to Tama's bedtime addas with her grandson in 1960s Calcutta on her phantasmic upside-down house in Dhaka, in erstwhile East Bengal. What is important for us to keep in mind in the context of Thamma's Addas in post-partition Calcutta, as well as that of Bongobala and Ponchanon's Adda in a tribal village in early 1970s West Bengal, is that Calcutta, and indeed West Bengal post-1947, was crumbling under the pressure of the state's derelict infrastructure and an uncontrollable influx of East Bengali Hindu refugees. This generated a fierce competition between the East Bengali migrants or Bangals and Calcutta's native West Bengali residents, the Ghotis, for education, employment and the basic amenities of life. Tamma, in fact, makes a further distinction between the privileged pre-partition Bangals, i. East Bengali Hindu emigres like herself, who came to Calcutta before 1947, primarily as economic migrants in search of better employment opportunities, and the disenfranchised post-partition refugee Bangals. In other words, the refugee Bangals for Tamma denote the East Bengali Hindu refugees who arrived in West Bengal after 1947, compelled as they were to abandon their native homes in East Bengal in the wake of the deadly communal violence unleashed by the partition. What I would like to draw to your attention via my analysis of Tamma's Addas are the complications involving the memorial politics of representing the East Bengali voice. It must be conceded that the East Bengali voice has not received adequate representation in mainstream Adda narratives. And in that sense, it remains a marginalized voice as the quintessential discourse of Adda is very much governed by the Bhadralok's West Bengali ethos. Yet Tabma's subject position in the shadow lines, though that of an East Bengali female other, is not really a marginalized one. This is because her cultural self-fashioning is very much determined by the quintessential Bhadralog gentility, which she imbibes as an urban Bhadra Mohila, i.e. as an educated, gentrified Hindu Bengali woman living in Calcutta. Moreover, she regards her status time and again as that of a respectable, 
cultured East Bengali Hindu emigre who arrived and settled in Calcutta before 1947 and went on to become a school headmistress. She thereby distinguishes her subject position, notes Ananya Kabir, from the, de from the deprived lot of, quote, the post-partition refugees from that same East crowding the city of Calcutta after 1947, unquote. Tamma's exclusionary demarcation of her East Bengali status quo as a privileged pre-partition emigre not a disenfranchised post-partition refugee, marks her, argues Kabir, as, quote, the Bengali Hindu subject already emplaced within a West Bengali modernity, unquote. Nevertheless, Thamma's East Bengali alter ego betrays an unvoiced yearning for her native home in Dhaka, which she discursively attempts to recover in the course of her bedtime addas with her grandson through the phantasmic world of her upside-down house. And it is this repressed East Bengali story space that I will now explore. I will thereby tease out the playful rhetoric of Thamma's addas as the memory of her upside-down house story mutates into a succession of retellings. And these belated iterations divulge the schizophrenic divide between her East and West Bengali subjectivities. Tamma's upside down house story mutates into a succession of narrative transferences as follows. Tamma initially makes up the story for her sister Maya during their childhood addas in Dhaka. She then goes on to recapitulate it for her latter-day Adda sessions in post-partition Calcutta with her grandson, who is also the narrator of The Shadow Lines. Uh, in the process of doing so, she passes on the law to the memorial realm of her grandson's retrospective narration, and he, in turn, reconstructs these Addas for the novel's readers. In other words, Tamma first narrates the upside down house story to her sister when they were children growing up in Dhaka before 1947. She then re narrates the story to her grandson when he was a child growing up in 1960s Calcutta, and her grandson recounts these others to the readers of the Shadowlines. In her earliest memory before 1947, Tamma's Dhaka house was inhabited by quote, a big joint family with everyone living together, unquote. However, after the death of Tamma's grandfather, her father and his elder brother were no longer on speaking terms. And soon things came to such a pass that they decided to, quote, divide the house with a wooden partition wall, unquote. The memorial legacy of the upside down house is built upon Tamma's imaginative childhood response to the family feud. Next slide, please. And I quote, when the house was divided, Tamma said, Maya was very little and she didn't remember the other side at all. So later, often to frighten her when she wasn't going to sleep or something like that, I would make up stories about that part of the house. Everything's upside down over there, I tell her. Their books go backwards and end at the beginning. They sleep under their beds and eat on the sheets. They cook with jatas, brooms, and sweep with their ladles. They write with umbrellas and go walking with pencils. And Maya grew to like these stories so much that every night I'd have to make up a new one or she wouldn't go to sleep. But you know, the strange thing was that as we grew older, even I almost came to believe in our story, unquote. Now, the passage I've just read out is a recollection by the grandson, I, the narrator of Kosha's novel, of the upside down house story as related to him by Tamma during his childhood adders with her in post-partition Calcutta. The idiosyncratic humor of Tamma's Addas and the Upside Down House derives its rhetorical agency from the comedy of manners that she imaginatively attributes to the family members of her uncle, i.e. her father's elder brother. Hence, her cousins in the Upside Down House sleep under their beds and eat on the sheets while their books go backwards and end at the beginning. As evident from the quoted passage, 
the other side of the partitioned house, which came to be occupied by Tamma's uncle and his family, is not upside down in reality. Yet the alternative space opened up by her phantasmic narration reveals how the upside down house story serves as a rhetorical refuge for Tamma. The story enables her to cope as a child with the emotional turmoil of her extended family separation and later as an adult with the tragic repercussions of the 1947 Bengal partition. Although Tamma categorically dismisses the partition as an event without any direct or significant impact on her life. The narrator's representation of his grandmother's story, however, does not ignore the discursive association between the partition of her family house in Dhaka and the partition of Bengal in 1947, and correspondingly, the partition of her West Bengali self-fashioning from her East Bengali nostalgia. In other words, Tamma's quintessentially West Bengali modernity prompts her not to recognize the underlying psychosocial link between the partition of her Dhaka house and the partition of Bengal. She also consequently refuses to identify with the East Bengali refugee subject position. However, her grandson acknowledges and remembers these links. By doing so, he enables the readers to gain a deeper understanding of the psychosocial conflicts constituting her complex East Bengali otherness in post-partition West Bengal. Hence, the grandson's narration rhetorically mobilizes the post-memory of Tamma's others. And this serves to indicate how her repressed East Bengali subjectivity perpetuates a schizophrenic divide between the partition narrative of Dhaka House before 1947 and that of Bengal in 1947, i.e. between her acknowledgement of one partition's loss and her denial of another's. This psychological schism is reflected in her skepticism about the interpretation of brotherhood. Uh, next slide, please. In later years, it always made my grandmother a little nervous when she heard people saying, we're like brothers. What does that mean? She would ask hurriedly. Does that mean you're friends? As for herself, having learned the meaning of brotherhood very early, she had not dared to take the risk of providing my father with one. Tamma attributes her distrust of friendship between brothers to the after effect of her family divide in Dhaka. The communal disharmony between Bengal's Hindu and Muslim fraternities leading to the partition of the province in 1947 is not acknowledged by her quintessentially Bengali identity narrative as another possible reason behind her interrogation of brotherhood as a signifier of friendship. However, her grandson's recollection of these other sessions deploys the microcosmic divide of Tamma's joint family in Dhaka as a reflexive foil to the macrocosmic memory of the Bengal partition. He accordingly demonstrates how the traumatic legacy of the partition lurks in the rhetorical recesses of her upside down house story as an unvoiced presence in absence. He does so, for instance, when he discursively links the memory of Tamma's family divide and her semantic interrogation of brotherhood to the repressed subtext of her nephew Tridib's death in the Hindu-Muslim communal riots in East Pakistan in 1964. A tragic aftermath of the violence unleashed by Bengal's 1947 partition, Tridib's death in the 1964 communal riots is only hazily alluded to in the novel till it is revealed in the course of the grandson's canteen under with his college friends in the 1980s. I won't go into the details of this Adda right now, but the point I'm trying to make is that the memory of the partition, of the Bengal partition that is, surreptitiously infiltrates the memory of Tamma's uh, family partition 
and lingers as a disjointed appendix to the rhetorical framework of her upside down house story. Unassimilated into the narrative space-time of her family feud, the repressed subtext of the Bengal partition disrupts the linear chronology sealing off the partition of Tamma's Dhaka house before 1947 as a closed past meant to be leisurely recalled in Addas after 1947. Thus, the submerged realm of Tamma's East Bengali story space reveals how the memory of Bengal's geopolitical divide intervenes in the discursive domain of her familial divide to cut across the rhetorical ambit of her upside down house story. And her upside down house story deconstructs via her undas these private and public histories of partition as the fragmenting affect of her post-partition Bengali selfhood. My reading therefore employs in Chakraborty's terms the quote-unquote verbal transactions of Tamma's Addas with her grandson as a discursive lens for examining her partition Bengali subjectivity. In other words, the grandson's recollection of Tamma's Addas on her upside-down house probes the memorial link between the partition of her Dhaka house and the partition of Bengal. And by doing so, the grandson's narration scrambles the linear temporality of her respective Bengali self-determinations before and after 1947. His rhetorical retelling of these dual partition narratives thereby betrays the schizophrenic divide between Tamma's East and West Bengali discourses to project the non-linear historicity of the 1947 partition. Tamma's Addas on the Upside Down House thus demonstrate how the everyday verbal transactions of this popular Bengali talking practice come to be inflected by the memorial legacy of the Bengal partition. And in the process of doing so, her otherized East Bengali voice unravels the quintessential modernity of her Calcutta Addas as an irreducibly partitioned one. Let us now proceed to the next part of this lecture on uh, Ghatok's Jukti Tokwar Goppo. The film is set in post-partition West Bengal against the backdrop of the 1947 Bangladesh Liberation War. It maps the Adda sessions in the course of a whimsical road trip, bringing together an alcoholic intellectual Nilkonto, played by Ghatok himself, an unemployed engineer, Nochiketa, a penniless Sanskrit teacher, Jagunnath, and the young Bangal refugee woman, Bongobala, who escapes to Calcutta when her East Pakistani village is raided and her father murdered, presumably by West Pakistani forces, during the 71 war. The aimless rovers venture beyond Calcutta's enervated urban precincts to brace the pastoral abandon of West Bengal's tribal countryside. On their way, they meet the tribal artist Ponchanon, who, besides being a mask maker, is also an ustad or expert on the Cho tribal dance. And they spend the night in Ponchanon's village, uh, now, Ghatok does not grant a specific place name to this village, but in all probability, it is located in Purulia, the westernmost district of West Bengal, bordering the present-day state of Jharkhand in India. And it is on this occasion that Bongobala stays over at Ponchanon's house and they engage in an adda on the Cho dance and its embodiment of the mother goddess Durga. Uh, my reading of Bongobala and Ponchanon's Adda session aims to demonstrate how Kotok's cinematic imaginary mnemonically intersperses Adda's leisurely verbal transactions with an embodied experience of divine sight called Darshan. Uh, Ghatak's synesthetic technique of juxtaposing a practice of talking with a practice of seeing, I argue, mirrors the psychosocial confusion of a partitioned Bengali body politic as it struggles to make sense of its fragmented modernity. 
Now let's have a look at the video clip of this Adda scene. Next slide, please. This one? Yeah, and if you hover over, I think the video would start playing. Yeah, no, 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 no. The slide before, sorry. Yeah. And if you hover over this, no, if you click on the video itself, I think uh, an icon should appear. No, no, no. So if, if you go mm -hmm. that, yeah. And if you just click as you did before. Uh, OK. Yeah, down below it's... somewhere. I think it should play. No. It's not playing. OK. The um, option is not coming. OK. I don't know why that's the case. Then I'm going to explain what has happened in the video. Right. OK. So no good, right, Shubham? We can't play it at all. Just uh, let me try. If you could just move the cursor down a little bit. Uh, yeah. Where and... the screen, yeah. Oh, no. That is the slide number. That it's not I showing didn't... the. Uh the uh, option to play the video okay no yes. no problem if you could go to the next slide i'm just going to explain what happens in the scene right so here's my translation of this adda dialogue now let me quickly sum up what happens in the video which we couldn't see uh, so the adda between bongobala and ponchanon begins with bongobala gazing in wonder at ponchanon as he puts his finishing touches to a mask for purulia's cho dance festival uh, their conversation playfully animates the linguistic maneuvers of a well-known Bengali children's rhyme, Agdom Bagdom Ghuradom Shaje, uh, to segue into Ponchanon's recollection of the Cho dance's glorious history during the Malla reign in the western part of medieval Bengal. Their talking session thus reassembles, I contend, the, mnemo uh, the mnemonic or the memorial fragments of this popular Bengali nursery rhyme to advance a post-partition representation of different Bengali alternatives to Adda's West Bengali Bhadralok modernity. Now, Bongobala and Ponchanon's Adda accordingly revitalizes the mnemonic agency of the Agdom Bagdom rhyme to spiral into Bongobala's revelatory manifestation as a non-Bhadralok or tribal avatar of the Hindu mother goddess Durga. And this is occasioned by an embodied act of divine sight, better known as Darshan, which Ponchanon uncannily experiences. Now the term Ma Thakuron, that Ponchanon uses to refer to Bangobala translates as mother, mother goddess, or even as the homemaker or Grihini. Um, it is interesting to note that in the subtitle text of the video, which we couldn't see, Ma Thakuron has been translated as child. And this somehow seems to infantilize Bangobala's gesture of representing herself as a tribal Choduga. On the other hand, Ponchanon's Bengali term Matakuron bestows upon Bongobala the empowerment and agency of the Hindu Bengali mother and homemaker who, when the need arises, can also manifest herself as a divine incarnation of Mother Bengal through the embodied practice of Darshan. I will talk about Darshan in a moment, but let me highlight a few other things before that. Now, though Ponchanon is devoted to the task of making masks of Hindu gods and goddesses, these are Cho masks, exuding a distinctive tribal reinterpretation of the esoteric Brahminical ideology pervading the Hindu Bhadralok conception of the divine.
Though Ponchano dutifully adheres to the hegemonic strictures of the Shastras, i.e. the Brahminical Hindu scriptures prohibiting women to perform the Cho dance, yet he recognizes Bongobala's transgressive potential as a Cho Durga, who proposes a non bhadralok alternative to the Brahminical iconography of the Mother Goddess. And though we're already very well aware of the sociocultural prejudices and discriminations constituting the caste system and its Brahminical master narrative, it is nevertheless worth emphasizing in the foregoing context that this particular Adda registers a non bhadralo consciousness of the fact that the Hindu societal norms of bhadralo Bengal and indeed of the Indian subcontinent at large has been dominated since ancient times times by Brahmins or upper caste Hindu priests and scholars who monopolized the authority over Hindu religious discourse and ritualized Sanskrit as the privileged language of sacred texts and learned men. Sanskrit thereby came to assume an almost exclusive control, as Sheldon Pollock explains, over, and I quote, all ideational and expressive functions in inscriptional and formal written discourse, unquote, while assigning to regional vernaculars and dialects, quote, the quotidian status and function they had in everyday life, unquote. This in turn generated the contentious Margi Desi distinction in Indian cultural history between the Sanskrit high tradition and the local little traditions. Now, the Sanskrit high tradition was also espoused by the Hindu Bhadralok gentry, um, and this is known as the Marga, which translates as the singular Sanskrit way, while the local little traditions are known as the Desas, which refer to specific embodied practices of different vernacular places. Uh, hence, Ponchano, next slide, please. Thank you. So, uh, hence Ponchanon in this Adda scene from Jukti Takku Argoppo employs his Desi practice of place to embody Bongobala as an insurgent Choduga. He thereby advances his tribal interrogation of the Brahminical Sanskrit grand narrative of the Mother Goddess Durga as canonized by the Hindu Bhadralok Marga. Now let's move on to Darshan. Now there are several theories of Darshan as for instance the Rasa theory, the Ayurveda theory. However, we're short of time now. So for the purpose of this lecture, I'll refer to Deepesh Chakraborty's explication of Darshan from his essay, Nation and Imagination, the training of the eye in Bengali modernity. Next slide, please. Right. So. In this essay, Chakraborty defines Darshan as, quote, the exchange of human sight with the divine that supposedly happens inside a temple or in the presence of an image in which the deity has become manifest, murti. Murti literally meaning that which has become manifest refers typically to the image of a deity, unquote. Chakraborty subsequently goes on to uh, examine uh, Rabindranath Thakur's nationalist poetry to delineate how the Bengali female subject came to be deified by the Bhadralok patriarchy in the wake of the Swadeshi nationalist movement in early 20th century Bengal as, quote, an affectionate, protective, all-giving, powerful mother goddess of the Hindus, unquote, Ai Maduga who, according to the Bhadralok nationalists, would safeguard the spiritual home of Bengal and India. So in other words, the Bengali female subject came to be envisioned as the Murti of Mother Bengal and by extension of Mother India. Thus, Chakraborty concludes that when Rabindranath saw the female uh, Bengali subject's Murti manifested as the Murti of Mother Bengal, he practiced Darshan. And in this nationalist practice of seeing the divine, quote, seeing beyond the real, 
shared practices sedimented in the language itself spoke through the figures of speech, unquote, that Rabindranath employed while envisioning the murti of the Hindu Bengali mother goddess. Chakraborty then goes on to distinguish the embodied aesthetics of darshan from, quote, the mentalist subject-centered category of the imagination, unquote, as canonized by European epistemology. He argues that darshan belongs to the sphere of practice, the performative aspect of Hindu Bengali nationalism. And this is what he says, and I quote him. To understand darshan, we do not have to erect a category called the mind, unquote. Therefore, when Rabindranath experiences the darshan of Mother Bengal, quote, it is his language that refers to darshan almost as an unconscious matter of habit, unquote, in first Chakraborty. Hence, darshan enters the historical vocabulary of Bengal's Hindu nationalists as, quote, habit, as part of their habitus, as uh, ready to hand in Heideggerian terms, as an element of the embodied cultural practices that inform their experience of nationalism." Unquote. When Ponchanon sees Bangubala as a Chaudurga in Jukti Takwar Gappo, he practices Darshan. As I've already mentioned, this is a non-Bhadralok tribal avatar of Madurga, which interrogates the cultural memory of a canonical Bhadralok darshan of the mother goddess. Ghatak's cinematic imaginary thus teases out the alternative memorial paradigm of a divine reality to capture in Walter Benjamin's terms the quote-unquote optical unconscious of Bongobala's darshan as Panchanun's Chodurga. And the discursive poetics of such a darshan is sedimented in the linguistic materiality of their adda itself. The verbal transactions of Ponchanon and Bongobala's adda accordingly facilitate the embodied practice of darshan through the ready-to-hand material vocabulary of their talking session. For instance, the rhythmic chant of the word dance, i.e. the Bengali term nach or nacho in their adda, transfigures the acoustical melody of the oral utterance nacho into the manifested enactment of Bongobala's darshan as the choduga. And the sensuous realism of Bangubala's moving image is channeled by the ocular frame of Ghatot's camera into the embodied aura of Pontanun's divine sight. Hence, the embodied vocal articulations of bon, uh, Bongobala and Ponchanon's Adda re-access the mnemonic recesses of their other Bengali language worlds to open up the optical unconscious of a Bangal Chodurga's image world. It is important to note in this regard that Ghatok's post-partition memory complicates Bongobala's vernacular narrative by blending her rustic East Bengali ethos with the folk ethos of a West Bengali tribal world through the playful rhetorical parlance of the Agdom Bagdom rhyme and her subsequent embodiment as a Bangal Chodurga. Thus, Ghatok employs Bongobala's placelessness as a refugee to both remind us of her East Bengali pastoral roots and affect her transposition to an other Bengali space-time of the folk through Bongobala's regional displacement from an East Bengali periphery to a West Bengali tribal margin, Ghatok also interrogates the Calcutta Bhadralok's traditional stereotypification of East Bengal as the quintessential Bengali hinterland. The Adda session between Bongobala and Ponchanon thereby deconstructs mnemonically the boundaries of the 1947 partition to redraw the narrative margins of the East Bengali refugee and West Bengali tribal into a dialogic process of exchange.
Consequently, the intersecting peripheries of the Bangal other and tribal other juxtapose a practice of talking with a practice of seeing to subvert the hegemonic Hindu Bhadralok memory of Ma Durga and Mother Bengal. And by doing so, Bongobala and Ponchanon, through the audiovisual physiognomy of their adda and the darshan of the Bangal Chodurga, propose their own idiosyncratic resolution to the psychosocial confusion of a partitioned Bengali body politic. They do so by enabling Khotok's cinematic imaginary to mobilize the cartographic irresolution of the Bengal divide and to endow the border between the East and the West with an interstitial agency of creating, dissolving, and reinventing a new, a fragmented Bengali space of belonging. And this is a space that is predicated upon the mnemonic repositories of the Bengali marginalia. What such a space problematically obfuscates, however, is the memorial archive of a non-Hindu Bengali subjectivity. Bongobala and Ponchanong's conglomerated subaltern imaginary of the Bangal Chodurga, despite its peripheral non bhadralok agency, remains girdled within the representational locus of a Hindu mother goddess. Bongobala's tribal avatar is, after all, an incarnation of Ma Durga. Indeed, the Bengali Muslim subject remains but a shadowy spectral presence in Khotok's film, and in Ghosh's novel too, for that matter. Ghosh does, however, attempt to displace the normative preeminence of a West Bengali Hindu modernity by drawing Tamma out of the complacent, time-warped cocoon of a pre-partition emigre status in Calcutta. Tamma is thus thrusted into the alternative space-time of a post-partition return to her abandoned East Bengali homeland, predicated post-1947 upon the discursive parameters of a Bengali Muslim worldview. As the novel progresses, we find that Tamma's schizophrenic remembrance of her uncle's estranged family via the phantasmic realm of her upside down house story rekindles her connections to East Bengal. She comes to revive her Adda networks with her extended Bangal family and friends, and thereby learns that her aged uncle is still alive, though as a languishing invalid in post. 47 Dhaka. This inspires her to visit East Pakistan in 1964 when she meets her uncle in their ancestral house in Dhaka, i.e., the house which was partitioned before 1947 due to the family dispute between her father and uncle, and thereafter came to serve as the rhetorical premise of her upside down house story. Uh, Further to the 47 partition, this house comes to be inhabited by a Bengali Muslim rickshaw-puller, Khalil, who looks after her uncle, and a Bihari Muslim garage mechanic, Saifuddin. Nevertheless, Tamma, as an Indian Hindu-Bengali foreigner visiting her uncle's Dhaka house after 1947, establishes firmly her subject position as a Bangal Bhadramohila from West Bengal, who has come down to Dhaka to perform Form the quote unquote serious duty of taking her uncle back to India. Thus, when Saifuddin, in quote, his rapid Hindustani eccentric Bengali, unquote, tries to engage in an adda with Tamma to draw attention to his non Hindu ethnic background as a Bihari Muslim who migrated to Dhaka after 1947 from his native Indian hometown. Motihari, Tamma salvages the conversation from what she perceives as a useless indulgence in nostalgia. She asserts the centrality of her subject position as an Indian citizen and a pre-47 East Bengali Hindu emigre now well settled in the capital city of West Bengal. She therefore cuts short Saifuddin and asks him about Khalil's whereabouts. 
Her brief exchange with Khalil too is rechanneled to execute her quote unquote worthwhile, though eventually unfulfilled objective of quote, rescuing her uncle from a now foreign land unquote, and bringing him back to her adopted West Bengali Hindu homeland. Jukti Dokkor Goppo, for its part, relegates the narrative topography of the Bengali Muslim subject to the spectral trace of a bowl at Calcutta's Prince of Ghat. And the Prince of Ghat, as you know, overlooks the banks of the River Ganga as it flows through the industrial heartland of the West Bengali capital, Calcutta. A mystic sect of itinerant Bengali folk singers blending the religious aesthetics of Vaishnava Hinduism and Islamic Sufism, the Baals embody the effective heritage of a syncretic Bengali culture. However, the film doesn't develop a coherent story space around the other Bengali worldview of the Baal. The Baal is reduced instead to an obscure figural presence whose Bengali Muslim subjectivity only becomes evident from his humorous folk song on the diurnal Islamic prayer cycle, Noma Jamar Hoilunada, which translates as, I could not offer my namaz or prayers. Bongobala's involvement with the Baal too is conspicuously confined to that of a silent spectator. It is bereft of the linguistic materiality of a concerted verbal correspondence in stark contrast to her wholesome adda with Ponchanon. Indeed, it can be argued that the film's post-partition imaginary by configuring the story space of an adda around the marginal identity narratives of the West Bengali tribal Ustad and East Bengali Hindu refugee woman problematically overlooks the memorial realm of the Bengali Muslim mother. In fact, the communicative agency of the Baal song is subsequently overshadowed in the film by a hyperbolic Brahminical celebration by the Sanskrit teacher Jagunnath of the Ganga's mythopoetic glory. In other words, the river Ganga might serve as an idyllic backdrop for the Baal's philosophical witticisms on the Bengali Muslims' daily prayers, but eventually remains affixed, I argue, in Jukti Takwar Goppo's cinematic landscape as the sacred bedrock of a Hindu Bengali cultural identity. And so, to conclude, to sum up, this lecture has employed the talking practice of Adda as a discursive method of examining a post-partition Bengali subjectivity, interrogating in the process the quintessentially Bengali modernity of the Bhadralok Adda. It has accordingly established how the rhetorical agency of Tamma's Addas with her grandson and Bongobala's Adda with Ponchano mobilizes the non-linear historicity of the partition and how the everyday verbal transactions of this popular Bengali leisure pursuit come to be inflected by the memorial legacy of the uneasy affect worlds produced by Bengal's cartographic rifts before and after 47. To that end, I have delineated how the mnemonic recesses of Tamma's phantasmic upside down house story and the embodied poetics of Bongobala's Darshon as Ponchanun's Bagal Chodurga reanimate the alternative story spaces of Adda's other Bengali modernities. At the same time, however, and as I have demonstrated, the Bengali Muslim identity narrative is granted no more than a figural presence in both Ghatuk's film and Ghosh's novel. Consequently, the memorial realms of Tamma, Bongobala, and Ponchanon's post partition subjectivities, and indeed the other Bengali space times of their Addas, I contend, recycle the putative subalternity of the Muslim into the representational domain of Ghosh and Ghatok's uh, respective Hindu Bengali imaginaries. In other words, the remembered space times of Tamma, Bongobala, and Ponchanon's post partition discourses can only liaise reductively with the spectral traces of the Bengali Muslim subaltern as fleetingly 
etched out by the subjective lineaments of Kosh and Khotoks, Hindu Bengali metanarratives. Indeed, the Bengali Muslim story space has been largely neglected in contemporary scholarly analyses of Adda social practice, and a lot of work still needs to be done on the memorial legacy of Adda's um, post partition Islamic modernities, both in West Bengal and Bangladesh. And on that note, I will draw this lecture to a close. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for that fascinating talk, especially in the context of uh, post-partition Bengal and India, uh, especially within the times that we are living. Um, so I open the floor to questions um, or observations, comments from the audience that we have with us today. Uh, uh, do you have any question in the YouTube chat box? Uh, I have checked that. I don't see any question posted in the comment section. Okay. Then uh, may I ask you a question, uh, Dr. Shiel? Sure. Since I, yes, thank you. Uh, since I was busy with uh, the PPT and I could not play the video, I'm sorry for that. No, that's so fine. Uh, the thing is that uh, the identity of Cho Durga that uh, mm -hmm. Ghato shows in the film mm -hmm. mm -hmm. do you consider it also to be a kind of appropriation of mm -hmm. the Cho identity within a more Brahminical discourse of the identity of Durga? Um, well, it is, I would say, I mean, in the context of the Brahminical discourse as, you know, sort of projected by Khotok's cinematic imaginary in that particular art, the sequence, he seems to be reinterpreting, you know, the parameters of the uh, Brahminical discourse. So I, I mean, rather than falling into or ascribing to a certain Brahminical ideology of representing the Cho, I would say that it actually interrogates, you know, such frameworks. So the moment, I mean, you know, sort of Brahm, uh, sort of uh, uh, Bongobala's metamorphosis is actualized um, as this, you know, potential possible Bangal Chodurga is the moment that I think Khotok also sort of launches his own cinematic intervention as to how, you know, the standard Brahminical ideologies of the Hindu Bengali mother goddess could be deconstructed uh, uh, to to represent other, um, yeah, non Bhadralok uh, incarnations of um, the mother goddess. I don't know if that answers your question, but um... okay. Do you uh, do you have any other questions, Shubha? No, no, it's fine. Okay. Uh, okay. I do not see any other question in the comment section yet, but I do have a question out of my curiosity and limited knowledge mm -hmm. in the field. And uh, this is more so to do with a generic understanding of the term Adda. Mm -hmm. uh, does Adda reflect an aspect of the modern self as Chakraborty and Chudipta Koviraj, you know, explores the term, uh, the modern yeah, self? Yeah, I mean, obviously modernity is um, a term which was subjected to its own you know, reinterpretations and deconstructions in the course of the 19th uh, and 20th centuries. In um, the case of Adda, I would say, you know, the 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 sociality that Chakraborty talks about in the context of early 20th century Adda itself did undergo revisions, you know, in the latter half of the 20th century. So post-partition, uh, you see more sort of commonplace or subaltern Adda's gradually um, um, gaining um, prominence, though, you know, they were like in initially in the form of, um, for example, uh, female Addas in everyday railway uh, rail compartments, in the ladies' compartments, in local trains. Um, and these, I mean, these were obviously, you know, the, uh, uh, the other sites and scenes that you could commonly see apart from what came to be, you know, pejoratively labeled as Choto Loke Der Adda, as uh, Gajano or as uh, small talk. But later, um, you know, 
went on to occupy gradually, I would say, um, a parallel space, which was, you know, that of um, uh, the non bhadra Loka Adda. So I would say that Adda as um, discourse, as a cultural institution, gradually came to be deconstructed in the course of the 20th century. Sadly enough, these subaltern narratives of Adda um, have not been examined uh, in depth or at length uh, and certainly merit greater investigation um, and um, and I, I guess you know the modernity of Adda itself underwent a process of um, reinterpretation in in the course of how Adda came to be remembered post partition so the memorial indices or the memorial paradigms of the partition did inflect that bit of how Adda came to be remembered, represented, or how the canons of uh, the, uh, the canonical discourse of Adda could potentially be de deconstructed. I mean, as uh, for instance, a text like Jukti Tokugopo shows, you know, um, very clearly, like, you know, it is um, uh, no longer the Bhadrulok Adda sphere that we are sort of confining ourselves to. It moves beyond the city of Calcutta and goes into this nameless tribal village in Purulia. And you have uh, these uh, um, non Bhadrulok characters uh, engaging in a uh, totally different kind of Adda. Uh, I mean, an Adda totally different from what we are otherwise accustomed to uh, with regard to the stylized canonical um, um, uh, mores of the Bhadralok Adda that you uh, saw in the early 20th century, um, for instance. Right. Thank you. In fact, that was fascinating. And in fact, you had mentioned a very interesting um, phrase, if I can uh, recall it. You have mentioned something called the subaltern Adda. Mm -hmm. And as far as the modern self undergoes, it's mostly, you know, a middle class and upper uh, you know caste mm -hmm. understanding of the self which mm -hmm. is divided as uh, mm -hmm. Deepesh Chakraborty and Shridika Kopiraj mm -hmm. understands mm -hmm. it as division between the uh, private and the mm -hmm. public self where the public mm -hmm. self is mm -hmm. put up mm -hmm. and they are the ones who are creating this course while yeah. uh, you know you are giving agency to this Adda uh, mm -hmm. and to the subaltern by mm -hmm. creating a space for the subaltern Adda because like Spivak says, the subaltern cannot produce a meaningful discourse. At yeah. least whatever they speak is not mm -hmm. considered mm -hmm. a discourse. Mm -hmm. so that was a very interesting uh, take on, on, on it. Um, Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shin, uh, we have a few. Um, yeah, you were you. Uh, no, you I, no, 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 no. Yeah. Over to um, you, actually. OK, so we do have a few questions that have popped up. Um, mm -hmm the uh, comment section uh, so we have a student of our college Shritama mm -hmm. and she has posted this uh, question uh, she's asked you if it is possible would you please elaborate on the distinction pointed out between Nach and Nacho okay yeah thanks uh, so um, you know uh, so when I, I, I wish I could show you that uh, scene uh, you know that it would be more emin, uh, evident sorry it would be more evident as to what really went on between that semantic slippage between that and Nacho but um, uh, but you know it was sort of a rhythmic chant that um, you know Ponchanon was uh, iterating when he had this darshan and he says uh nacho tumra na nachle amader kichui hobe na you know in the uh, sort of um, uh, i don't know it's yeah i don't know why it can't be played but well but uh nevertheless uh what happens here is that you uh, uh you know the the way ponchanon un, uh sort of pronounces nacho is a very sort of non podrolok um uh, um di uh, dialect that is um in display in in that scene and the reason i also wanted to show you that video scene was because the sights and sounds of uh, the Adda in progress in a very sort of um, non 
urban setting and in a very, I mean, employing very rustic, um, uh, non Bhadralok, atypical Bengali accents, which are nevertheless Bengali. Uh, uh, but but uh, sort of, um, uh, I think that the aesthetics of Naj and Nacho somewhere are configured in, you know, the gap that is registered between you know, not as a kind, you know, a, a dance, right? A dance which could be reconfigured in different respects, like, you know, the classical um, Indian Brahminical understanding of dance, say Bharat Natyam. Then not also as, you know, the dance in this very sort of tribal, non bhadralo context. And Nacho actually is uttered by Ponchanon as Lacho. And he goes on sort of repeating this uh, utterance. And that sort of goes on also to show Ponchano, I mean, the pride that Ponchanon takes in his um, non Bhadralok uh, linguistic usage of Bangla. Because elsewhere in the film, you see Ponchanon and uh, Jagunnath in a verbal duel where Ponchanon sort of defends his stance um, uh, with regard to, you know, his agency um, as a non bhadralok subject and therefore, uh, you know, defends the way in which he speaks Bangla. He says that, you know, it might not be the same as Ponchanon's, but it can definitely not, I'm sorry, it might not be the same as Jagunnath's, but can definitely not be undermined by Jagunnath. So I think, um, you know, that, that again, that sort of uh, discursive slippage between Nat and Nacho is also channeled by, you know, the verbal and the ocular imaginary of Ghatto into a synesthetic um, discourse, which sort of, you know, bends the word really and brings out a completely different evocation of under from what we are otherwise accustomed to seeing in uh, in the College Street office, uh, coffee house in Calcutta, for example. I see okay. there's a comment here. Um, it reminded me of Triloknath Mukhopadha's Dumro Charitya, where we came across a lot, uh, a lot many tales with capital R, the spirit of night. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, in fact, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but a recent translation of Dumro Charitha has also been published. Um, I think Deepesh Shokabuti gives a foreword to that. And um, of course, you know, that was like the 19th century world where Adda was straddling these um, uh, 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 sort of the offense really you know between the Mojlish and the Adda so Adda was still coming into its own so um, those were the days where you know sort of Adda as intellectual conversation was gradually gaining a democratic space out of you know the wealthy patrons home parlor and you had these um, you know, intellectual others, for example, in uh, uh, bookshops in College Street, which sort of held regular literary others or Shukumar Ray's Monday Club, for example. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, certainly like the other spirit of 19th century Bengal, as most of you would be aware, I mean, was quite a stylized sort of Bhadralok mode of reinventing how it is that you talk smartly. Obviously, you know, the latter half of the 20th century had its own ways of undoing that. Uh, so we do Better. have a, another question. Um, and this has been posted by Shampuna Choudhury, another student of ours. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that's flashing on the screen as well. Does the migration of Tamma being before only affect her identity which she came to terms with after she had um okay i think um i would say that this was um you know tamma's identity as a pre-partition you know so tamma migrated to bengal before 1947 
and um, even before she held her bedtime adders with her grandson, she was always very sort of particular to point out that I am an emigre. So I have sort of, I wasn't driven by the partition to come to Calcutta. I came here because of, uh, I mean, in search of economic opportunities, my husband had died. I had to look for a job to raise my son. And that's why I came here. So the partition was not really mentioned as something which affected her migratory behavior, you know. However, obviously this you know, the space of the Adda that is opened up by her bedtime Addas with her grandson does make that divide or does make that conflict that persists within Tama uh, with regard to her identity as well before and after 1947 comes to the fore. Um, and I think, you know, Thamma's identity um, as sort of a Bangal, you know, was on the one hand, of course, centered around this distinction that she made between the pre-partition Bangal emigre and the, like herself and the post-partition Bangal refugee, you know, uh, who was disenfranchised. And she said that I'm certainly not like them in a, you know, in a far more sort of settled position. But... The psychological schism, nevertheless, was propelled by, you know, the uh, space uh, that that other or those other sessions with her grandson unwittingly opened up. So I would say that her identity as a migrant sort of stands obviously in conflict with how she self fashions you know, or how she fashions herself as a West Bengali Bhagamoy does. So, so it is, yeah, in other words, a migrant psychology um, undergoes its own process of revisioning herself through um, the mores and through the narratives that she sort of uh, um, uh, placates herself with when she fashions herself into a West Bengali Bhadra Moila in post 47 Calcutta. So um, I don't think we have any other question in the comment section. And um, okay, so. Um, that was uh, indeed deeply thought-provoking pro session. Thank you, Dr. Sheel. And you. Uh, thank you for the very lucid present presentation of uh, such difficult uh, terms, Dorshon, Adda, and you know, really relating them together so well. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all our participants, because without all of you, this uh, lecture series would not have had been possible. I would also like to thank the organizers, the Department of English, Gokhale Memorial Girls College, and definitely our principal, uh, Dr. Otto Shikarfa, without whose su support this lecture series wouldn't have been possible. With that note, I'd like to end this uh, uh, talk today here. Thank you. Thank you for having me and good day to all of you. It was a pleasure having you here. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. I am trying to log myself out. So is it just Leave Studio, Shubham? Yes, yes. Leave Studio. Okay. All right, then. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. 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 See you. Bye. See you.